shape. Uh, tonight, I'm presenting the first of three talks, and they're entitled Union with Christ. And you can see the subtitle, Scripture, History, and Practice. So tonight, I'm going to try to give you a sense of the scriptural teaching that surrounds this idea of union with Christ. Our next uh, study, next Sunday night, will be on the history. Who are the theologians, the, uh, the biblical students that developed this idea and shaped it? How did that come about? And then thirdly, our last one will be on practice. If we understand what the Bible says, if we appreciate how it developed in history, what do we do with it? Does it have any real benefit, any practical significance for our lives? And uh, that will be uh, the, the third of our studies together. I want you to know this was a, a topic I delighted to pursue, but I didn't propose it. I was given this as my homework assignment. And when I was told that that's what I was being asked to do, I said, well, praise the Lord. I wouldn't uh, want to do anything else. If you gave me a choice, that would be right at the top. So it's a real pleasure to engage this topic, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Let's pray together as we pause for a moment. Lord, as we open up this concept, as we study together, as we open your word, we ask that you might be our teacher. You promised in your word that God would teach his people, that he would write his word upon our hearts, that the spirit of God would illumine our hearts and minds to the truths that are therein. So Lord, we come to you this day and we ask that you would be uh, enabling us to appreciate a concept that is truly greater than the very world we are part of, for it is eternal in nature, all-encompassing, and yet very personal. We thank you for these things, and we bring them to you now, humbly seeking your grace in our lives, through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, so as we begin, uh, John Murray is one of the founding professors at Westminster, as you probably know the story as they began in that very auspicious year of 1929. Uh, that was the year when you didn't want to start a nonprofit anything. And the fact that we still exist after all these years is a miracle of grace. But John Murray was a young professor at Princeton. He left with Machen. And he was someone that was asked to teach in the systematic biblical theology program. And along the way, one of the works he wrote was called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. It's a work that would be well worth your taking time to find and read if you want to be serious about the extraordinary doctrine of salvation taught in the Word of God. It's a marvelous work, and uh, one of the things that it covers in a singular chapter is union with Christ. And because he is someone that I admire very deeply, I've tried to really engage carefully with what he said there and what you'll hear tonight is shaped by his thought, although I've either improved it or cheapened it, depending on your perspective, okay? So let's begin with some basic statements that he brings to us. First of all, union with Christ is a very inclusive subject. The wide span of salvation from its ultimate source in the eternal election of God to its final fruition in the glorification of the elect. So the first thing he's telling us is that this doctrine takes us from eternity past and takes us all the way into eternity future. It spans eternity, and time is just a blip in the middle in which it operates. It's eternal in character. So if I want you to learn all of it, you've got to come with me into heaven because I can't teach it all in time. It's too big. So we can only give you a few broad brushstrokes. Secondly, he wants to emphasize it is not just a phase of the application of redemption. That is how saving grace comes and touches our lives and we come to faith and we become Christians and we grow. It's not just an aspect of that. Rather, it underlies all of the application and accomplishment of redemption. We're going to define more carefully the words accomplishment and application of redemption in a little bit. So I'll just use those words and let them hang, but we'll try to flesh them out shortly. And another statement he will make in his writing is that union with Christ is the central truth 
of the whole doctrine of salvation. Well, that's quite an extraordinary statement. He says if you're drawing a target of the doctrine of salvation and you want to get the heart of it, its union with Christ is the center point. If you think of a circle having a center point, everything surrounds that point equally. It's of equal weight. That should get our attention. One of the great theologians of the last century said this is the heart of what it means for you to be saved. Okay, so you ought to pay attention. It's important. But notice next, while it is a vast, all-encompassing doctrine, meaning it goes from eternity past to eternity future, it underlines all of the saving work that we experience, nevertheless, it has a specific part of the doctrine of salvation as well. And so you know, how it's fascinating how words can mean more than one thing. It can mean a narrow thing, it can mean a broad thing. And that's union with Christ. So he wants us to understand, while this doctrine is extraordinarily broad and deep, it also has a particular reference to the process of our becoming a Christian. And so he writes, union with Christ is an important part of the application of redemption. It means it's not just the summation and center point of everything. There's a point where it touches directly and so if we talk about geometry, since I talked about a circle, there's a tangent point. It's the point where it touches our lives. Okay? And this is because we do not become actual partakers of Christ until redemption is effectually applied. What he's saying is when Jesus died on the cross and did all that saving work, we didn't all become immediately Christians. There's a point when we were non-believers. In fact, Non-belief may have been part of most of our lives, and there's a point where we came to faith. And union with Christ became a personal experience. So while it's a doctrine that encompasses everything, it has a punctiliar character that touches our lives. So we can think of some scriptural examples that emphasize this. When Paul is writing in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, he will talk about the Ephesians who are the chosen people of God. Nevertheless, there was a time when they were without Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, even though they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Isn't that fascinating? It's a point where they were in Christ by divine purpose. But in time, it was not a reality. And they had to come to be united to Christ. Yes, they were chosen, yet Christless until effectually called into fellowship of God's Son. Perhaps you can turn with me quickly. I'm going to look at a lot of scripture tonight. I hope you have a Bible handy. And we're going to, I'll read them all so you can hear them if you don't have time to turn to them. And of course, the notes will be available. They're all, I think, recorded. You can download these later. There's no copyright on them unless John's copywriting them. You just go and he can claim them and make them his. I'm getting them out there for the good of the kingdom. I don't know what he's doing with them, but <laughs> I, I know my stuff doesn't sell that much, so he's, he's probably spiritually inclined too. But at any rate, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 and, and listen to the language uh, that is used there as Paul is writing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says this, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is a faithful God who made a call, and the Corinthians received that divine call that brought them into fellowship with Jesus Christ our Lord. That is a synonym now of what we can think of as union with Christ. In fact, we'll see the phrase, in Christ and with Christ as the biblical phrases that describe union with Christ. But the point is they were called into this relationship. So what's it saying? It is a part of the application of salvation. And that's why uh, Paul can write in Ephesians 2, 3, by nature you are children of wrath, even as others. You're outside of Christ. And yet in eternity past, as we're going to see, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
a vast eternal reality that has a specific point. So, if you want to find a way to put these two ideas together, sometimes you'll hear theologians speak about effectual calling. Effectual calling is very different than uh, what human beings do. Have you ever had a dog run away from you and he doesn't want to come home? That happened recently with my grandchildren's puppy that came along to the house and he broke loose of his uh, leash and off he ran. And I said, Teddy, Teddy, come home. And he just kept on running. I had a very ineffectual call. But the kind of call that God has is, Lazarus, it's time for you to wake up. Come on out. That's called an effectual call. That's the kind of call that God has. It's the kind of call he had in your life when you came to faith. When you realized you could not say no anymore. You said, it's true. I need Jesus. I can't say no. That's God's sovereign. That effectual call is the moment where you were united to Christ. So union with Christ is, in terms of the application of redemption, synonymous with the effects of effectual call. But that's one point of what is an entire doctrine that's sweeping in character. So they both are true. So there's a little bit of joyful ambiguity here that we need to recognize. So what I want you to understand is that we are going to talk briefly about effectual calling, but we're not going to use the phrase union with Christ in that narrow sense. But in that broad sense that sweeps from eternity past to eternity future. And so hence, union with Christ is linked with effectual calling that yields the beginning of the partaking of Christ and the enjoyment of the blessings of redemption in the life of the Christian. Okay. So that's some clarification. Now, so what we need to do now is to try to get some vocabulary in place, and we're going to speak of four distinct concepts of the doctrine of salvation. Now, if I really wanted to sound erudite, I would talk about soteriology here. That's just the Greek word for the study of salvation. So the doctrine of salvation. There's four words, the history of salvation, and because theologians used to speak only Latin, we have to keep Latin words around. Historia salutis. You'll hear theologians speak about the history of salvation. The second thing we speak about is the accomplishment of redemption. When salvation, the purchasing price of sinners from the judgment of God and under the slavery of Satan, when they are purchased on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. That language is paid in full, if you take the Greek word. And then there's the application of redemption. When you turn around and sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. When that general work of the gospel accomplished by Christ becomes personal, when it becomes yours. And that is then the difference between accomplishment, what Jesus did on the cross, and then our receiving of it, and our own experience in life, which is, of course, for most of us, 2,000 years after Jesus, when we come to a saving faith. That's the application. And then a fourth word, not only the history of salvation, what God has done in history, what Christ did to accomplish it, what is applied to us in our experience, and that is, what is the order in which these benefits which Christ has purchased are given to us? Can we draw them out in a logical order? What comes first? What comes second? What comes next? Now, I'm going to try to put that all together with a chart that I put over here. So let's take a look. Can, will you hear me? Do I need a microphone or can you have Katie Bird help me go over here? I'll, I'll try to do this so that we can go over here. Okay. 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 All right. That's good. All right, so as we look at this, you can see the general phrase, union with Christ. And so by the history of salvation, we're speaking about God's eternal plan and eternity past. We're going to look at scriptures to support what I'm saying, but these are the ideas. And then out of eternity, there was a creation and a fall and the process of redemptive history that leads to the cross. And then the church that finally takes us all the way to eternity. That's what we mean by the history of salvation. 
Union with Christ spans the entire history of salvation from eternity to eternity, including the cross. When we talk about redemption accomplished, we're talking specifically about Jesus' ministry, what he did when he came into the world in the incarnation, his perfect life, his suffering, his substitutionary death, his definitive salvation, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his ever living to make intercession for his people. That blessing that he purchased then is individually applied it's applied to us by repentance and faith and by our coming to know the gospel. And it comes through specific benefits, which we can begin to identify as predestination and calling and justification and glorification. We'll see that in a moment, okay? So I wanted you to see in a big way how they all fit together. These four ideas, union with Christ is encompassing all of this. The whole history of salvation, the specific work of Christ in history, the application of that salvation to you as an individual, and then the specific way it's applied to each individual as it's worked out by grace through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the ideas all integrate in that following way. Now, Let's try to take a look at these as we go through. So let's talk briefly about the history of salvation or the Historia Salutis. We start with the eternal counsel of God. God who is eternal outside of time has determined by his own plan with his son and by the work of his spirit in a pre-temporal, before the world was even created, to have a covenant of redemption. Jesus will talk about this when in, in his high priestly prayer in John 17 about how the Father is coupled with the Son to save a people in his love for him and to have a kingdom that will flow from it. We call that the pactum salutis, the covenant of salvation. Okay, Then the history of salvation, creation. God created a world. Adam is placed in it, and here we have the idea of the covenant. It goes by various names, the covenant of works, if Adam had obeyed, or it was the covenant in Eden at the very beginning of mankind, the covenant of creation. Sometimes it's called the covenant of life because Adam, who had life, would have been established in life had he persevered. That covenant is broken. That's what we call the fall. The relationship between God and man are in a broken covenant. He's fallen from the gracious position of being the representative of God's perfect work on earth. And that fall has consequences, a curse that's uh, cosmic in character. It's a significant issue, but God doesn't abandon his work. In the history of salvation, we have the word redemption and the covenant of grace. We, we had a whole series on that a few years ago, as I recall. And th that covenant takes all the covenants of the Old Testament and it brings us to what Jesus does in the New Testament. The Lord's Supper, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the revelation that Christ brings through his work of redemption that gives us that ultimate hope that there will be a new heavens and a new earth that will usher in eternity. Uh, I think I said it uh, last night. I'll say it again here. A wonderful way to summarize the Bible is creation, fall, redemption, and hope. It's brings the entire message of salvation into a few simple words. God has created. We have broken the covenant in the fall. He's redeemed, and that gives us an ultimate hope. So that's what we mean by the historia salutis. Now, this phrase, union with Christ, is encompassing all this. So this phrase is that broad. This whole story is within the story of union with Christ. Now, the accomplishment of redemption Okay. Christ coming in the history of salvation, Christ's work. There, it is captured in his word, it is finished. And you can uh, think of each of these. Each of these would be a wonderful study if we were going to go at length in Christology. The incarnation, God becomes man, fully God and fully man in one person. He lives a perfect, sinless life of active obedience. He obeys all of the law. Isn't that amazing? 
He had no sin nature. He loved the Father perfectly. Unlike us, we're unable to love the Father even when we really love the Father because we struggle with indwelling sin. He was perfect and sinless. This act of obedience was coupled with what theologians call his passive obedience. That is, when, as he simply endured the curse, the Father said, as our substitute, you must bear. That passive obedience includes all of his suffering, but especially what he endured on the cross that caused him to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22, the dereliction of the eternal Son of God by the Father. God, abandoning God, Luther said, who can understand? It's a mystery beyond words. But that's part of the accomplishment of redemption. He's bearing the curse, sin and death for us. This death, theologians following the teaching of Scripture, Isaiah 53 in the New Testament, is vicarious or substitutionary. And Reformed Christians studying the Scriptures have come to the conclusion it was not a provision of a salvation, but an accomplishment of a salvation. It paid the price for everyone for whom it was intended, and therefore we call it particular or definite. For those of you who remember our tulip study, that's the L in the tulip, the limited atonement, the precise giving of the Son for those chosen by the Father, those drawn by the Spirit, and those who persevere unto eternal life. They are all connected. Christ has been raised, been raised from the dead. He is the victor, and he has ascended to heaven where he is seated on a throne of grace. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's the one that says, come to me, for I can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. And he has not left us as orphans. He sent to us the comforter, another comforter, like unto himself, the Holy Spirit who has come in New Testament glory and fullness. The Spirit was always with Israel, but not like we have him today. Paul says it's like with unveiled faces the glorious gift of the Spirit. And Christ is reigning. He's on his throne right now. He is accomplishing his purposes. They are mysterious to be sure, but he is not failing to accomplish the end he's declared. And there will be then his second return. All of that is part of his accomplishment of redemption. There's a sense in which salvation is yet to be fully realized when he finally comes and completes all that he said he would do. But that salvation is already ours by faith in Christ. So, the history of salvation, redemption accomplished. Then we talk about the application of redemption, the amazing grace that we experience. This too is part of union with Christ. What does it mean? This is now personal and individual. This is when you, recognizing yourself as a sinner, and that by faith, you pass from wrath to grace by saving faith in Christ. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was blind, but now I see. I now have life. God is no longer angry at me. He loves me and his son. That was a real moment in time when the application of redemption became yours. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is marked by conviction of sin, by understanding of the gospel, by repentance, which is saying, I'm not living for that God anymore. I'm living for the God who is Christ. And it is seen in saving faith. What does saving faith have? If you're a believer in Christ, you have what theologians call notitia. You know something. You know that Jesus is God who died in the place of sinners. He rose again from the dead and that his blood is redemptive in power. You know that. You've assented to it. You say, I agree that it's true. It's not just facts that I can talk about. I accept them as true, but it's even more than accepting them. You are depending on them. And you stand before God, and at the gates of heaven, they said, why are you going to come into heaven? What right do you have? I'm depending upon the truthfulness of what you've done for me in Christ. I'm trusting in him. All of this, then, all that we see here is reflected then in what theologians have called the ordo salutis, the order of salvation that's applied to us. What does that look like? Well, this is what we call the logical order of salvation. 
And biological, we mean it's not necessarily done five minutes here, ten minutes there, two years here. It's like this is, seems to be the logic in which it unfolds as we put the scripture together. The key texts are well known to you, but it's Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30. Uh, it, it Just to summarize, it says uh, that we know that God has chosen a people. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay, that he is going to be the firstborn of this whole family of people. So you see, there's, those words are logically concatenated. They're like the links of a chain. Which link in a chain do you have to pick up to pick up the chain? doesn't matter. You pick up any one, the whole chain comes because they're all connected. That's the point. He says, if you're predestined, you're going to be justified. If you're justified, you were predestined. If you were called, I hate to say it, but you're glorified. It didn't look so in the mirror this morning, but you are already there, seated with Christ, we'll see, in heavenly places. And so this logical connection of things goes like this. And I'm interpolating a few others. Theologians have said, Paul didn't sit down in Romans 8, 29 through 30 to be exhaustive. He was being suggestive of the many benefits that we have. So we can look at other passages and say, this is what the ordo salutis looks like. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those whom he predestined, he also regenerated, gave the new birth. And those whom he regenerated, he called. You know, you would not have heard unless you had life. You had to have ears to hear. God had to give you ears to hear. So when he called, you could say, I hear my master calling me. He was working, knocking on your door, giving you life even before you heard the gospel. He was giving you life so that you could respond to the gospel. And those whom he regenerated, he called. And those whom he predestined and regenerated and called, he also justified. He declared them righteous through faith. Faith alone is the instrument that brings the righteousness of Christ, not by our works of merit. Saved through grace, by faith alone. Faith is the only means. But those whom he justified, he also intends to conform to the image of his Son. And two of the words that we can find throughout the New Testament in Paul is that he adopted us. We were made sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. And by being adopted as his sons, he says, I'm going to see to it that you look like my firstborn son. I'm going to start chipping away at you. Do you remember that great story when Michelangelo had that great block? And he said, I'm going to make David. They said, how are you going to turn that block into David? I'm going to chip away everything that's not David. That's what Jesus does with us. He chips away everything that's not Jesus and keeps on putting in his grace to us. It's a lifetime, never complete. But it's something he's doing, that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That's the daily reality of the Christian life. But it doesn't stop there. It takes us from justification, he says, he also glorified. Meaning that we will be like Christ, and in a sense, we already are. Already, but not yet. It's what we are by union with Christ. All of this is part of the union with Christ. You see how rich this is? All of history, all the work of Christ, all the application of redemption, and each phase of the Ordo Salutis is part of that. If we had time, we could put all of this into connection with the total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. But theologians well describe this Ordo Salutis as the golden chain of salvation. It's a chain. It all comes together. And so whatever order you pick it in, they all come. And that's the chain that the Father by the Spirit has put around your heart and life because of Jesus Christ. You have the chain of love, a golden chain, and you belong to him. Now that was worth coming for, wasn't it? Shouldn't we give a little applause to the Lord for that? Okay, and praise the Lord. That's that's what he's done for you, okay? Okay, now we're, we're just getting warmed up now. Are you ready? Okay, let's keep going. So then, 
What then is union with Christ? We need to define these terms. We've described them in their massive glory, their breadth. Well, consider three words you know well. Union, reunion, and communion. You notice they all have the word union in them. So they're related somehow etymologically. So we know a union is joining together such things that are separate so that they become a singular whole. That is the union we have in the United States. You know, the different colonies banded together and they said, we're going to make a, a union. Okay? And of course, a union doesn't always survive. We had a civil war where the union was rent. And so it's not that you just have to have a 50-year reunion like I'm supposed to have. It's actually 50 plus 2 because COVID is postponed. I haven't gone to any of my reunions, so I'm going to miss my 52nd too. High school is so far back, I can't even remember what it was like back then. Okay. But uh, a reunion is joining together such things that were together and were separated. Well, that's the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace is a reunion. People made in God's image, broken. And there's a restoration of that union. And there's a sense in our more personal life where sometimes we stray from the Lord and we have to confess. We've never lost our connection, but we have a reunion of authentic obedience and love by saying, Lord, forgive me, the cleansing of the gospel. And of course, communion, that becomes a synonym for the Christian sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But what is communion? Communion is a mutual joining together of two distinct parts to further secure their union. We use it in the sense of sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. And thus, it has become a name for our sacrament. So the idea is that you can be united, and you may not really want to be in that connection. You can think of a prisoner that's chained to his uh, captor. He's not real happy about that. They're united, but there's no joint connection there. Communion is... We're connected, and we want to strengthen our bond. We want to be together. That's what the Lord's Supper is. It's communion. It's what we should be experiencing when we fellowship with one another in the body of Christ. But it's what we should have in our daily union with Christ. We are united to Christ. We have been reunited to him by the covenant of grace. Humanity was broken, and we ought to be deepening the relationship that he's given to us. Now, I've been talking about a lot of theology. I've been trying to summarize a lot of truth. So the question is, is this biblical? So are you ready for a biblical waterfall of lots of truth? Okay, here we go. Look at all those references. Okay, I'm going to try to read them quickly, just so you can say, well, maybe there's biblical data for what I'm talking about here. See, I've got all them marked here. Let's see if I can find them. We're going to start with Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. I bet some of you have this memorized. If you're Reformed as a Christian for a few years, you know these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. Okay, in Christ. The key phrases in Paul's letters are in Christ or with Christ. Those are the keys to say I'm talking about union with Christ. Okay, in Christ or with Christ. Okay, he's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Okay, Ephesians 1, 4, right here. You're chosen in Christ in eternity. Before there was ever a world, before creation. That's hard to get around, you know that? That's hard to be an Arminian and teach that verse. That kind of forces you to say, well, maybe God really is sovereign. He, before the world ever was, made choice of a people, and it was united to Christ, in Christ. That's how serious union with Christ is to God the Father. It's all in him. Okay? Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 11. This is a, long, a longer passage, but I'll highlight a few things. It says, How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Okay, so our baptism is a symbol of being in Christ. Baptized into his death, his cross. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. His death is ours. We are united in Jesus' death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You can see there's this union with Christ in his life, his death, his burial, and resurrection. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, united, we are joined to Christ in his historical death, burial, and resurrection, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We are joined to Christ in resurrection, so much so that resurrection is sure. His resurrection means our resurrection because we are united to him. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Did you know that as a Christian you died on the cross with Jesus? You were there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You were. You're a believer. You were in Christ. You were dying in Christ. The purchase price of your death was in his death. It says... The body of sin might be brought to nothing because of this, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. <clears throat> For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So union with Christ is the entire sense of what it means to be a Christian. I died with Christ. I was buried with Christ. I was raised with Christ. Therefore, I live a new life. Paul will go on to say, don't let your instruments be submitted then to the ways of the world. Be, you're an instrument unto righteousness. Imagine that you're a guitar. That's an instrument. What can a guitar, what kind of music can a guitar play? It can play any kind of music the guitarist wants it to play. So you're going to give it to B.B. King, you're going to give it to, uh, let's say, Andre Segovia. You're going to hear a different kind of music. You're an instrument. Who are you giving your instrument to? To the world? Or you say, I, no, I, I belong, I'm united to Christ. You know, a good guitarist goes nowhere without his guitar. They're united. You're united to Christ. Does Jesus take you every place he goes? That's, that's what you're supposed to see, your union with him. Take a look at another passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. As we just meditate on uh, Paul's teaching at this point on our union with Christ. So e Ephesians chapter 2, verses Four through six. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'll let that sink in. You were raised from the dead with Jesus Christ. Easter Sunday was your resurrection because you were joined with him. Jesus is seated in heaven. Guess where you are? You are seated with him in heavenly places. That is extraordinary. That's what Paul is saying. This union with Christ means that you were not only chosen in eternity past, but when redemption was being accomplished, you were united with Christ in every one of those things. Your union with him is included Take a look at Ephesians 1, 7. It says, In him we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of the trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In him, right now, what he accomplished back then is what we have right now. What he did then becomes ours. It's applied to us. We were in virtue of his plan, united to him, and then by our salvation, through faith, it becomes ours. Well, we could go through all of these references 
and, and you can see them, and our time won't let us read every one of them. But each one of these, if you go through, will take you through every stage of these things and show that they're yours because you are in Christ. You are united to him. In Christ, with Christ. So this would be a whole beautiful study in its own right if we had time to just unpack them. I read enough of them to make the point. Let me read one last one, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Because this describes your everyday life. Uh, you, most of you have memorized verses 8 and 9. You know how it says, uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, But verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, Jesus not only has paid for all of our sins by grace saving us, but we are created as new Christians in Jesus. So the good works that he does are going to be in you too. God's determined that ahead of time. He said what Christ has done, you are going to do. God has ordained this because you are created in Christ to do good works. Christians are going to do good stuff. Why? Because Jesus does. Why? Because we're united in him, and Jesus is living his life out through us to whom we're united. Okay, it's an amazing series of truths that we have before us that we need to meditate on and say, how do I take them all in? Romans 8, 17 tells us that we will be glorified in Christ. We're already seated in heavenly places in Christ. All right, so we want to finish up with a little bit of time looking at the biblical illustrations of union with Christ. I gave you a number of data points. I looked at maybe a third of them, gave you references for your own study. So you can say, wait a second, there's a lot here. And by the way, we're only looking at the references from Paul. We're going to look at John's references as we teach a little bit more over the next couple of weeks. We're just looking at Paul, but John will have similar statements about our integration. We'll see one of those in just a moment. So the biblical illustrations of union with Christ, I, there's a nice phrase that we, I found in, in John Murray's article. He said, the wide range of similitude of Scripture to explain or illustrate union with Christ is striking. He said, there are many illustrations of this union with Christ, and they are from many different spheres, and it should get our attention. You know, when you say something is striking, it's like someone just slapped you in the face. Hey, wake up. Did you see that? This is striking. This is amazing. And what we'll find is that it will move from the lowest level, from the inanimate world, to the highest level, to the divine, that we can look at nature and we can look at God. And at each of those points, we're going to find a truth that helps us to understand what our union with Christ means. Now, Murray will emphasize this. It's an important emphasis. Remember that analogy or similitude does not equal identity. When we are compared to God, it doesn't mean we are God. Okay, that's what he's really driving at. So when Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep, did he say, well, you know, I really am a door? No, he didn't mean that. Okay, he, he was saying, I'm like a door. There's a parallel. So what we need to do with the similitude or analogy is to capture what is that point of essence that brings them together. So uh, I won't look at these references now, but I'll summarize them. And I want to wrap up so we have maybe have a time for a few questions or comments at the end. But let me go through these. And uh, again, the uh, outline will be available. If you want to get these printed off by Pastor John or Pastor Patrick, feel free to do so. If people want them, you have my blessing to do that. Okay. So notice the first one, the, the inanimate world, the stones of a building and the cornerstone. In Ephesians 2, 19 to 22 and 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, that's used of our union with Christ. What's he getting at? What does a cornerstone do? Do you realize when you put a cornerstone down, it determines the orientation of every other thing in that building. Everything is shaped by it. If you get it off, everything is off. If you get it right, everything is going to be square. It is absolutely determinative of orientation. 
Okay, our union with Christ means if we're really united with Christ, we line up with Jesus. If you're not lining up with Jesus, then you're not connected to the cornerstone. How can you claim to have union with Christ? If your orientation is defined by something other than Jesus Christ, let me tell you, this is a big deal today, isn't it? I'm oriented this way. This is my identity. The Christian is my orientation is Jesus Christ. That's who I am. Everything in my life, I'm trying to line up with Christ. There's nothing more relevant than I can imagine if you understand a cornerstone in a building. It determines everything. When you say, I am a Christian, that Jesus is Lord, you say, I'm trying to line up with my king. He's in charge. That's what union with Christ means in one sense. Notice the second one, life and nourishment. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me will bear much fruit. Okay, that's a beautiful analogy. What is it? What does a branch know about the vine? So if I get disconnected, it's all over. Why? Because this is where my life comes from. This is where my nourishment comes from. This is what gives me energy to grow. In other words, union with Christ is saying, I have no life unless it's rooted in Christ. I have nothing to sustain me as a human being of true value unless it finds its beginning in connection with Christ. If we can live independently of Christ, you're not united to Christ. How about that? It's not just a cornerstone. It's the source of life and nourishment itself. Okay, notice the third one. It's compared in Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16, with the head and the human body. Now, I'm not a physician. I don't know a lot about anatomy, but I know this much. If you get disconnected from your head, your body's in trouble. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? That's, that's, that? The guillotine will do it pretty quickly, right? Okay, so the point is, what does the head do? It provides direction for the entire body. It provides control for the entire body. It provides coordination for the entire body. If you take away the head, there is aimlessness, there's chaos, and there's conflict. Union with Christ means the orientation of my life, the control of what I do, and how I get along with others are because of Jesus Christ. He is who I am. He directs me. He is my head. How about this? It's compared to marriage. Now we know that marriages are not all made in heaven, and no marriage is ever perfectly heavenly. We need to confess our sins to one another, and that means in family life too, even in the best of marriages. But how does a marriage compare? Well, it's a covenanted communion means there is a legal commitment that I can't walk away from without consequences. It's, it's, I'm bound. And at its best, it's not only legally bound, it is a one of communion where we're both working together to keep it intact. Okay, that that's means you got hope for your marriage when you're both trying to work to keep it intact. You can make progress if you're both making effort. Well... Our union with Christ is that God has made a covenant with us. There's a covenant in marriage. I will be your God and you'll be my people. We are engaged to be the Lord's. And that communion is, you know, you're, you can't hide from your spouse. You can try, but sooner or later, what you are, what you're doing, what you have, what you don't have, it shows because there's no place to hide. You're, it's there. There's an openness. And so it is with our union with Christ. Confess your sins to the Lord. He knows all about them already. Why not just be honest about it? Say, Lord, I got to come clean. You know what I'm doing, and it's not right. He knows. He knows everything. He knows the secrets of our hearts. We can't hide from him. And of course, loving care. Marriage at its best is when that spouse is at the bedside when it's rough, for better, for worse, sickness and health persevering in all those hard things. You know what? The Lord stands with us in our sickness. The Lord's never sick. We are sick all the time. I would have gotten sick of us if I were God. But he hasn't gotten sick of us. He perseveres with us. Our union 
is deep and strong because he is the bridegroom. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 29 where the bridegroom rejoices when the bride comes. And the best man says, that's his, not mine. That's John the Baptist talking there. Another illustration, you can see we're moving from the inanimate to the more personal, to the more noble and the lofty. These are all biblical illustrations of our union with Christ. We have representation before God. Um, you know, uh, the famous saying is taxation without representation was terrible. We're not sure that representation is any better, right? Some of us Americans, when it comes to April 15th, taxation with representation is pretty bad too. So who is representing you? Well, it's compared to Adam. Adam didn't do a very good job. By the way, since I stumbled into politics, let me give you a good simile here. I just read this the other day. Someone said, you know, giving politicians money and power is like giving a teenager the car keys and whiskey. <laughs> okay, I'll let, let that one sink in. Uh, that's not very sanctified. But then again, since I'm talking about Adam as our representative, maybe it's not such a bad illustration. Adam really got us in trouble, didn't he? Okay, well, bottom line here is that representation before God is a symbol of our union with Christ because there is a second and last Adam who represents us before God. Everywhere that Adam failed, the second Adam and the last Adam succeeded. And he is my representative. I'm united to him as the one who stands before the throne as my great high priest, as my older brother, as my good shepherd, as the one who I am united with. And then here's the last point, and we'll stop and open up for some questions with this. Rapid survey of an extraordinarily rich area that goes from eternity to eternity. We tried to do it in 40 minutes, so if I didn't do it justice, forgive me, I'm trying. But the last one is this. A profound, eternal, unbreakable love in unity. Let me repeat that. That's a lot of words. A profound, we can't get to the depths of it. Eternal, it doesn't have a beginning or end. Unbreakable, it's absolutely sure, and it's love, and it's uniting, and that is what it is because it is Trinitarian union in the Godhead that is used as an illustration of our union with Christ. The unity between the Father and the Son is a unity that we have between Christ and ourselves as believers. That's worth reading. Let's take a look at John chapter 14. At verse 23. You recognize that Jesus is in the upper room, and I'll put it a little bit in context here. Verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. Now, right in the middle of that, I'll, let me read it again. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we, Father and Son, will come to him and make our home with him. I'd like to ask you tonight, what is the address of God the Father and God the Son? Do you know it? It's where you live if you're a Christian. He lives with you. He's moved in. Let that sink in. He has moved in with you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the place where the Father and the Son dwell. And so we think, and we'll talk about this in our next lesson, the mystical character of union with Christ. Isn't there something when you're around a person who's walked a lifetime with Christ, you think, what is it about them? Something special. It's just a holiness, a presence about them. It's the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's real. It's beyond words. It's mystical, mysterious, but it is the description of God's dwelling in that person. That's why, as Christians, there's some people say, I just want to be around that person. I want to ask them more questions. I want to hear them. I want to learn from them. I want to connect with them. This is the wonderful gift of God's presence 
But when you look at these beautiful similitudes, they are striking. Going, if you will, from the inanimate to the very highest reality, God himself. Profound, eternal, and breakable love and unity is what we have in our Trinitarian union in the Godhead. And so what word would you use to describe this? Now you've got to remember, I'm reading John Murray now. I'm trying to learn from him. And he is a very dour, Scots, Highlander, doesn't show a lot of emotion. He has one glass eye. He lost it in World War I. You know, he's a, a tough as nails. He's in heaven now. You know, he was a bachelor his whole life until he retired and he took a secretary with him and married her and they had two children. And so he was 60 and above. You can start a family. He did it. So it, it, there's the story that's told that uh, when he lived at the upper level of Machen Hall, that's our old mansion building where we have our seminary, he lived up there on the top floor where students had rooms. We called it Murray Heights. Still to this day, a Murray Heights. And if the students were getting a little ruckus and too much noise, the door would open and out would come a hand with an eyeball. <laughs> and he would say, boys, I'm watching you. Let's keep the noise down. So he had sort of a dry sense of humor, you know. <laughs> okay. So a man who could plumb the depths of theology like this. I'm, look at I'm just riffing on John Murray tonight. This is not me. I'm just trying to tell you. What would you expect him to say? What word would he say if he says, what do you say about all of this? What word would you use? Well, here's what this Scotsman called it right here. Staggering. I can't take it in. It blows my mind. That's how a Scotsman says, it blows my mind. It's staggering. I hope you're staggered tonight. And that if you aren't, you study this a little bit more. The treasures of the gospel that are extended to you in Jesus Christ by your union with him is from eternity to eternity. It's an unshakable bond. That means it doesn't matter what you face any day of your life. It's nothing because of what he has for you and what he's doing for you right now. Oh, rejoice, brothers and sisters. How blessed we are.